Hello and welcome to Through the Telescope, the podcast that puts the lens on astronomy. I'm Rose Waugh and I'm an astrophysicist and science communicator. And I'm Elliot Bruce and I'm neither of those things, but I'll be trying to find out why we should even care about astronomy. We'll be exploring some of the big topics in the field in little manageable pieces and have some fun along the way. So, whether you know your red lines from your red shifts, or you're not quite sure what the difference between astronomy and astrology actually is, join us as we launch ourselves into the cosmos and try not to burn up on re-entry. Through the Telescope is sponsored by Pic Astro, the astronomy and astrophotography image sharing app, dedicated to your images of the cosmos no matter what stage you are on your journey around the universe. No ads, spam, or fake accounts. So, Ro. Um, <laughs> One day, can we start with something else? <laughs> no. Okay. So, <laughs> Ro, today we're um, talking about something a little bit different. Yeah. Um, to answer the question, why should we care about space? Which you ask me all of the time. Yeah. This episode we're talking about what has space ever done for us? And not in the sense of, well, it made the Earth, which yeah. is quite important, and it has the sun in it. What did our study of space, our space endeavours... Or space industry... ...do for the general population, for the human race, and not just the few who have been there? Yeah. Okay. Um, not just Jeff Bezos and his little trip up or anything. It's all space holiday. Yeah. Or I guess maybe we should also caveat that as what does space science tell us that it has done? Because some things are maybe a bit more, you know. Success has many fathers, I heard recently. A failure is an orphan. <laughs> um, so, you know, Scotland and China say that they both discovered golf. Discovered. Um, I don't think anyone discovered golf. <laughs> no, they it's, not like, it's not like a fundamental of the universe. Are we going to get like chucked off uh, our PhDs now from the University of St Andrews, slagging off golf? No, no. Um, golf is an amazing pastime. Sacred um, sport. Sacred. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I guess we should start with the obvious things. Mm. Space has told us about space, right? We're out there. In, Exploring. In the solar system. Yeah, yeah, we've actually done quite a lot of exploring. We, uh, I suppose, have only scratched the surface, mm. as the saying goes, but even right now there are 80 currently active space missions from NASA alone. I tried to look up, like, how many... How many uh, space missions have there ever been? And I found myself down like a rabbit hole and like oh, trying to count on the NASA website how many had they had, mm -hmm. on the JAXA website how many had they had. I was like, this is... And how many of them also count as This is as, not a as way multiple. for me to... This is not, not a thing. So, you know, these numbers are to be taken with a pinch of salt, yeah. I suppose. But they kind of give a picture. Yeah. Orders of magnitude... So, uh, yes. So, so yeah, there's 80 currently active space missions from NASA. NASA have finished um, 166 crewed flights and then over a 1,000 uncrewed missions. So that's quite a lot. And that's just NASA. Yeah. NASA's obviously big and famous. But, I've heard of them before. Um, ISRO, one of the Indian space agencies, have carried out 116 space missions. So okay. far, and 86 launch missions. ESA currently have on their website um, that they're involved in 96 active missions. When you say, why are you saying currently? Do you mean like their website's going to be updated in a few days? Or? <laughs> Just, it, I, 
I guess it will be updated in time. I don't know. Okay. Just like right now, as of today, when I looked on their website, currently, um, noting as you said that there is going to be overlap. Yes. So, so there'll be some joint NASA ESA missions. Exactly. So you know, ESA say they're that they're involved in ninety six active missions. Yeah. NASA say eighty. Yeah. Some of those are going to be the same. Yeah. Um. Because various missions are collaborations. Um, I found Jax's website very difficult to um, manoeuvre, so I can't really give you any, you know, numbers there. But they do lots of space space missions, um, and a lot, as we'll talk about later, mm. a lot of missions that involve, you know, kind of looking at the Earth from space. Right, involved yes. in that a lot. So there have been so many missions, there have been loads of missions to space, studying a whole range of different things as well. Yeah, like each of those, say, 80 active ones from NASA, some of them are looking out at, well, some of them are looking out at multiple different things, whether it's stars and planets and what have you, to looking back at our sun or our Earth, for instance. Yes. Or rovers. I mean, they could be exploring, like you say, a whole range of things. Typically, missions will have, you know, one aim, one main aim. I think we've talked about this before. Mm, you've got to prioritise. Yeah. Then, but then you have little side quests. Yeah, you can have uh, side quests, that's fine. But you have to have a main aim of your mission. Yeah. Um, and that can't be the same as something that's already been. Yes. I mean, it might be similar. It might be following on from. I think if you were trying to check something, that might be more of a side quest. Yes. You okay, know, right, like, yeah. it has to be... It has to be novel. Mm. So that's a lot of exploring. And a lot of studying. And I think, you know... So, I, so some of the things of what has space ever done for us is going to be very tangible, and some of it's a bit more... I don't want to be, like, hippie about it, but some of it's a bit more kind of philosophical, a bit more... All right, it transcends the mere common household drudgery of non-stick frying pans. Is that what you mean? <laughs> right, need? right, exactly. It's a bit more um, personal and people will have different views and stuff on it. But I think a lot of people probably listening to this would agree that studying space is quite humbling. It puts things into perspective a lot. <laughs> And the more that we learn about the universe, the more that feels to be true. You know, we are just a, a very tiny point in time on one planet around one star mm. in one galaxy, you know. So it's quite humbling. It's awesome. It's inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, there's loads of evidence that there was much more interest in science in general, not just astronomy, after the moon landings. Okay. You can find plots of um, of things like the number of um, people doing PhDs, mm. science PhDs, after the moon landing. Mm. And there's a very steep, you know, there's an obvious jump. And some of that is people obviously are, are more interested in potentially pursuing science. Mm -hmm. And it's also society changes, because right? yeah. it then values it more, and then... Governments and companies are more happy to sort of sponsor things. There's more opportunities, exactly. all of a sudden science There's more of happening. a reason to to do these things. And, I, you know, I haven't, haven't seen plots of, like, science undergrads or mm. science um, at high school or whatever. I don't really know if it would work in high schools, but I imagine there was more, a jump in... People doing undergrads as well. It's not just going to be PhDs, you know. Yeah, that's interesting so, though. What you're saying about is like all science, because you yeah. wouldn't think that people go to the moon and therefore people are now going to be studying about like the sociology of macaques or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, or sort of like I mean biochemical stuff. I don't know the breakdown of it. Yes, I don't know if there are much more people doing going into physical science than studying macaques or not <laughs> mm -hmm. after that, but it, it stirred up an interest in science. Yes, yeah. And that 
in some ways, was measurable. Mm. <laughs> Not in all ways. Um, Could that be a coincidence? And it just so happened that when we were able to be going into space, we were also, um, like, science was also expanding. Do you think that it is uh, causation as opposed to just correlation? So I personally don't think loads of people decided to go and study science and to make science jobs and whatever just mm. because some people stepped on the moon. You know? Yeah. Um, I think it is, like you say, it's much more complex than that. The drive for kind of science and technology was obviously starting off to enable people to get to the moon, regardless of, of their motives mm. <laughs> for that. But also having, you know... We, as a generation, have not experienced this. Yes. But speaking to, I was going to say the generation above us, but I guess we, we sit in that kind of strange place of which generation are we? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe not the generation above us, because I guess that's kind of millennials. Um, but But the generation above us and more like the sense of our parents' generation remember watching the moon landings. Mm. Yeah. And it's quite... I find it quite interesting asking people about it because it seems to have some sort of emotional response. You know, yeah. the, it's not necessarily... People aren't necessarily, like, mega into it or anything. Because, mm, you know, like some a... people are and some people aren't. But even people who aren't that bothered, it it's quite interesting when you ask them about it. Yeah. It's not something they just, like, will tell you about completely, like, factually with no... It was, it was an event that you could pin into yeah. your life story. Yeah. And maybe also had a cognitive shift related to that. And I can kind of see, like... Science and engineering has got somebody onto the moon. That's like a sort of a yeah. literal pinnacle of yeah, achievement. Yeah, and it causes a shift in society, right? Yeah. Like, And now if that's possible, anything's possible kind of thing. Is that kind of the idea? And therefore, mm. science. I, d I mean, I don't know if <laughs> that makes anything possible. Difficult, I also don't know if society at the time thought that makes anything possible, but... It's it's very, I think it's very interesting. Well, in it? American Pie, the song, not the movie, um, very different. Uh, the I, I do they know call, the song. So. Um, it's the generation lost in space, right? Yes. And because everything changes at that point, it's kind of difficult to as somebody that didn't live through the sixties, like it's. All of that period is like immense change. Right? Yeah. Social, political, economic, and scientific, everything. It's like yeah. crazy. And the Beatles were happening, so pretty good times. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> um, I think a lot of, you know, every generation seems to have some sort of period within it in which there's a lot of change. Mm in various different ways, and some generations have experienced a lot more of that than others. Yeah. Um, and some for good and some for ill. But I think... Yeah, I do think that space exploration has had a big kind of impact in society in a way that's not easy to measure. Mm. Um but it feels noticeable, even though we can't really... Even yeah. though I can't see how you would measure that in a kind of quantifiable way. Yeah, and I don't know if we talked in a previous episode or if you were just talking to me the other day, as you do, about when you... Not necessarily born, but when you are aware, as it were, at the time of a, an event that can change your sort of perception of things. Mm -hmm. Whereas... If you're, like, even born a little bit before because you're not really aware of what's going on when it happens, like, if you're, like, one years old when yeah. you're at the time of the moon landings, you grow up with, that's happened. Yeah. That's not, like, 
necessarily crazy anymore because that's just what happens. Yeah. That is history. Um, so I wonder if, as well as, like, those people that lived through that, experienced that, and then were like, oh, I'm, like, 11 years old, I'm going to go and do science with my life. Yes. There's also the people that were born a few years after, or even now, mm -hmm. who, although they weren't, they wouldn't necessarily think the moon landings, for instance, were why I got into science. They might still be like... It's in their sort of subconscious. It's part yeah. of their cultural kind of... And it's impacted their life in a way that they maybe can't understand because how how has that led to, you know, their parents maybe being more open to them doing science or mm. encouraging of them doing science or some school event or, you know, literally anything yeah. that they can't necessarily connect to a certain event. Yeah. But, yeah. Like you say, society's sort of appreciation of science. I can't imagine what it must have been like to have experienced that. Mm. And to see... You know, in your life, just people have gone to the moon. Mm. And they're on the moon, you know, for three days or however, whatever it is. Yeah. Every night when you look up, there are people there, you know. Mm. And then they come back. And just everything around. I mean, I just, I can't imagine what that must be. Like, that must just be... I feel emotional watching... You know, some some of the space events. Um, Rocket launches are always yeah. weirdly... Like I, I don't really know what it is about it, but there's something about a rocket launch that is just kind of... just exciting and emotional. Yeah. In a weird kind of way. Yeah. And I definitely remember as a kid watching... Um, or I don't know if I even like watch it, but just saw clips of being aware of the space shuttle. The space shuttle. Um, yeah. Also, the space shuttle was the coolest because there <laughs> so were like cool. so many different stages. So there good. were different bits. It wasn't just like the bottom drops off and then the new bottom drops off. It's mm -hmm. like the solid rocket boosters get thrown outwards mm -hmm. and then it flies upside down and then it's, yes. a and it's like so. And then oh, it lands like a plane. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, it so looks good. like a plane. It's like. <laughs> Is, is it a spaceship? Is it a rocket? Is it a oh. plane? It's, it's all of them. Uh. Anyway, we're, we're getting off topic, so... Yeah. yeah. It's given us space exploration and everything that came with that. Yeah. It's given us scientific understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're used to science in our own environment of the Earth. We don't fully understand all of the environments <laughs> of the Earth and the science that goes on in all of them. Yeah. But we we have some grasp of it and we're pretty comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But or the we environment, think we are. Yeah, yeah. The environments elsewhere in space, whether that's deep space or other planets or moons or stars, whatever, are very different to the environments on Earth. Mm. And so the science can be very different as well. Yeah. That's not as if the science itself is the fundamental science is different. Yeah. Or, or that it's changed or anything. It's just that we're in a different regime. Mm. So, you know, maybe different pressures or different temperatures or or something that are just very, very different yeah. to what we see on Earth. And so our understanding of science in general which yes. is based on our understanding of science on earth mm -hmm. is not necessarily the full picture because it doesn't work in that situation so i'm not normally the person who talks about the um meeting of space related things in their research life uh, but as a structural chemist i once met somebody who was also a structural chemist um, and they were talking about how they studied the different structures of ice, uh, water, ice, because they were saying that basically there are different ways that water molecules could condense into a solid. 
But on Earth, you only get the one kind that is ice as we know it. Right, yeah. And um, I was like, well, kind of like, where else? Like, <laughs> what, what, why do we care kind of thing? And they're like, oh, well, that's like, you know, these are like um, conditions where you might you might see those conditions in space. Mm-hmm. Um, and so water could exist in sort of frozen in different environments in ways that we wouldn't appreciate on Earth because... And it might behave differently in terms of yeah, how you exactly. might see it. So um, you then end up with a different form of ice on the on the surface. You might look at it and it might just seem like ice. It might seem the same. But actually, because it's structurally different mm-hmm. at a, a more um, a microscopic or sub-microscopic level, it could have different properties yeah to and therefore it could behave in a way that's different to what you would expect because you're like oh that's ice i know how ice works yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then it turns out you don't <laughs> you just know how a very specific uh, like type of ice works mm-hmm. and it, it could behave differently and it could also look different yeah. as well. Yeah. Like, yeah so yes i think that might be the only time i've ever met anybody talking about space in the research but you know uh. Um, so that's kind of the more, not philosophical, but the less tangible ways that space has done something for us. Yeah. Everything else that we have to talk about yeah. is much more tangible yes. than that. We started with the... Start with the foreword about oh space. It's like broadened our horizons yes. literally <laughs> and metaphorically. And aren't we more rich as a society? Exactly. Um, please give us lots of money um, to be scientists or whatever. <laughs> um, please pay for my research. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But now let's get down into the non-stick frying pans uh, <laughs> we're not going to mention non-stick no, frying pans we're not cause... going to I think everyone knows that one so let's just not also I don't really care it always sticks for me in a non-stick frying pan I don't know what I'm doing but <laughs> if you do know write in on a postcard I um, don't tend to have that problem I think I just but I also don't tend to fry things so mm. so in this episode or this part we're going to focus more on satellites and how we end up using space to look back at Earth in a way and how useful that can be. Satellites. <laughs> yeah, I think probably the, the main thing um, or the, the most obvious thing is satellites. They were the first thing we sent into space. So, makes sense. Um, I don't think it's particularly... Um, what's the word? Enlightening to know that Sputnik was the first um, satellite in space and it was a communication satellite. We talked about it with the Jodrell Bank episode briefly. And yeah. uh, we talked about how Jodrell Bank could track um, Sputnik. Uh, and then some clever people um, sitting around um, realised that if we could use telescopes to track a satellite, maybe we could use a satellite to track us. And Mm -hmm. so navigation was born. Uh, It had already existed before. Navigation did, yes. But satellite (laughs) navigation. um, In the form of GPS. Yeah. That was new. Yeah, global positioning system. (laughs) So, yeah, so first thing, even though it wasn't necessarily the earliest in a way, um, GPS, which I found out you actually need 24 satellites. Yeah. Four in six different orbits. Is GPS now... GPS is I don't the know, but... American one. I think it might even right. be... But is it now a word that is just used for things that aren't actually GPS? Yes. Yeah. Because we use it colloquially in yeah. the same way we might say, oh, Google it, and then... Yeah. We all use Google, so that doesn't work. But someone might use Bing, but they would still say Google, Google it or something. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, so GPS was originally the Global Positioning System service, um, 
as American, and then I don't know if it's just that that was the one that people use at least in the West, and then we developed other ones. The yeah. Europeans decided they wanted their own one, which I think is that Galileo, maybe. Um, the Russians have their own one. That I, can't I don't remember. know the name of any of them. No, because everything GPS. everything's called GPS, but there are other systems. Um, but I think a lot of stuff just relies on the actual GPS as well. But as well as navigation, so similarly, if you got satellite TV, yeah, common in rural areas, and lots of rural areas if you want to watch a thousand different channels, I guess. But yeah, um, that's true. But yeah, you're as a country bumpkin, you're used to more like I can't get. <laughs> I'm behind a big hill, so yeah. I can't get. I literally can't get TV or internet or anything. Please, can I have satellite? Because <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think um, one of the things that I always think of, especially when you see people like um, Jeff Bezos and William Shatner. Heading off into space, uh, and I know different people have different views on this. Um, is basically you've spent an awful lot of carbon to get up into space mm-hmm. uh, for tourism, yes. for the mega rich. Yes. Um, and similarly, in a related way of all the things that we have shot into space, whether that is like the space shuttle or um, JWST. Or William Shatner. Uh, (laughs) They've all been, like, done by exploding hydrocarbons. Yes. Um, The carbon footprint of space is quite large. Yes. Um, But, at the same time, it's also space that has given us the most... some Some of the most powerful tools when it comes to environmental yes. data. It has, um, yeah. So and also, I, not, I feel the need to defend a little bit, but there is a huge difference between sending, you know, a space shuttle mm. into space to do science than some rich people for, like, a few hours. Because if you're going to use that much carbon, you've got to use it wisely. So do you think if William Shatner took a little experiment up with him? <laughs> no. <laughs> but yes, it has provided us with a lot of tools for um, yeah. for understanding, protecting, studying our mm. environment on Earth. It's not all about space. Yeah. Um part of space is the Earth and a lot of a lot of space science actually involves looking at Earth not looking mm. out into the cosmos. Yeah, and there was a thing a few years ago now um, where they were talking about changing the sort of strategic direction of NASA to be away from monitoring the Earth and more into Space Force. <laughs> um, <laughs> you love Space Force. Yeah. Anyway, um but, yeah, I, I remember at the time that, that happened, it was like, you can't do that. NASA provides, like, all of the information, pretty much. Um, which is kind of scary when you think about it. Like, n- it's it's not the only, but, like, the fact that there's sort of a monopoly, almost. A near monopoly on, like, any kind of, like, scientific data, in a way, you know. Like, if NASA got shut down tomorrow, then a lot of things would be kind of screwed. Yeah. And that's is pretty big, so that is true. But also, that also works for other space agencies too. Especially when there's so much collaboration that goes on. You're right, yeah. Um, there's a lot, you know, a lot of money would be lost if suddenly one of them disappeared. Um, a huge amount of skills <laughs> mm-hmm. as well. But I remember there was somebody, again, at the University of St Andrews, who, in like the maths department or something, who their PhD was all about using, like, developing techniques to count lions or something. One of the one of the things in terms of like ecology is being able to study like animal population, which yeah. is difficult when you can't actually 
you know, unless you go out and count all of the animals. And these, yes. these only really works for large animals, right? Like you can't yes. count, like, termites. No. But maybe you can, because you can maybe look at termite mounds. But, you know, um, when, it's, when they cover a vast area, for instance, mm-hmm. then, you know, if you have a whole bunch of images and then you get a computer or a bunch of people mm-hmm. in, like, a kind of citizen science kind of way... Yeah, I'm about to come into my own here with this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, and you can say, oh, well, last year there were 74,000 zebras. This yep. year there's only 73,000. And yes. then you start to... It doesn't necessarily fix the problem, but until you know that there is a problem, you can't, like... Yes. It's part of... Part of the process of protecting animals, environments, ecosystems. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the one that I always think of is counting penguins. Is there a reason why that's the one you always <laughs> think of? You like penguins? Or? I like penguins. I like the story. It's a citizen science project. Um, I, I don't know. I think it also maybe hit the news as well. So Ticking all the boxes. Um, yeah. Um, for those who don't know, citizen science is the idea that scientists have a lot of data in some form, and that might be images, that might be something else. Um, it's often images because that's, you know, pretty accessible by comparison to all the data forms. Yeah. And you can't look through all this data yourself to do mm-hmm. what you want to do, to categorise it, to sort it, whatever. Yeah. Um, because there's so much of it. Mm-hmm. You know, because we're entering a new era of science um, and of life, really, for the human race, where there are just huge amounts of data on a level that we have not experienced before. Mm. You know? On a personal level, we all experience that. I mean, how many photos have you got on your phone? You know, I couldn't tell you how many photos I have on my phone anymore. Um, most of them are on the cloud. They're not even on my phone. Yeah. And they're all digital. Yeah. They're not sat on my shelf. Mm-hmm. So I don't come into the room and go, oh, gosh, I have so many photo albums here. I need to clear some out because this is getting out of control. It just gets out of control and then it's out of control and then it gets worse yeah. and then I don't deal with the problem because mm-hmm. it's out of control right <laughs> where on a personal level we actually all on a day to day you know basis now experience this huge amount of data thing mm-hmm. um, that's more than we can kind of personally deal with and in science we're having the same thing on a much scar- much larger scale mm-hmm um, and so you have all these photos, for example, and you can't sort through them. You can't get a computer to sort through them. Or you don't trust it to do it particularly well. Yeah. Or you trust it to do some aspects of it well, but not, not other aspects. aspects of it well. Yeah. So it might be very, very good at sorting something um you know, it might be really good at spotting zebras, for example, because it can spot black and white stripes. Yeah. But not very good at spotting something in the background. Yes. And that something in the background might be very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, it could be anything. Yeah. Um, and a human would spot that. Yeah. And yeah. recognise that as something different, something new, something interesting. It might also be Something think- unusual. You might also think that that black and white stripy thing must be a zebra, but actually a human would be like, no, that's just like a sort of shadow. It's right. Kind of like... Or Dave has turned up dressed yeah, as a zebra and yeah. the computer goes, there's a zebra there, and a human goes, that's a person dressed yeah. as a zebra. They've got a car that's right. white, but they've painted black stripes on it because that's going to look cool on a zebra tour. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Historically, this is something that computers are not very good at, Images, that's the only thing that stopped us from being overtaken by AI overlords. And that's also why we have to click on which squares are a traffic light or a car yes. or whatever. Um, oh, I actually have the problem quite a lot. Recapture, my worst enemy. It's always American. Yes. 
click sorry. on the fire hydrant. I'm like, <laughs> what's sorry? What's a fire hydrant? The number of times I've had to learn a new thing because uh, I just do not know what that word means yeah. all the time. Still happening. So you might want a computer to do some bits or none of it or whatever. Mm-hmm. You want people involved to some extent. But you still can't do that yourself. Because there's too many photos. There's too much. You don't have enough time. Um, you are a postdoc. You have a job for one or two years. And you can't spend nine months or whatever mm-hmm. looking through these photographs because you need to actually do the science. Yeah. Um, and so you call in the general public. Mm-hmm. And the general public will do, will help you with your task um, because they're interested, presumably. It takes a village. They're interested in the science, they're interested in um, in helping uh, and whatever. Yeah. Um, lots of discoveries are made this way. Um, and if you are a citizen scientist, you are an author on the paper of discoveries. Really? Yes, because <sighs> you have done... You've done work towards the science. I'm going to go on there now and do some citizen science. Where do I need to go? <laughs> so, the famous, or one of the famous ones, is the Zooniverse. Okay. Um, they have loads of stuff on there. They've got lots of spacey ones, because it's stemmed from Galaxy Zoo, which was a citizen science project that Chris Lintot started when he was a postdoc. Chris Lintot, for people that might not be aware, especially outside of the UK... <laughs> Is a he is a professor at the University of Oxford uh, in astrophysics, and he presents uh, the Sky at Night program. He does. Which Co-presents is... yeah, with Dr. Maggie. The last time I watched the Sky at Night, I think Patrick Moore was still alive. Oh gosh, so... that's a long time ago. <laughs> um, um, yes, he's a he's a famous. Scientist in the UK. Yeah. You've mentioned him before because you said that you, you saw him once. I did, yeah. You got very excited. I was. Um. Yeah. Um, so, yes, Galaxy Zoo was his, his project, sorting sorting galaxies into different things. Mm. Um, and then I guess it became Zooniverse from that, I guess. Because yeah. some, like, a, a committee decided Galaxy Zoo did not sound very good, whereas Zooniverse, that could be marketed. Maybe, maybe, yeah. They have lots of spacey ones, but they've got loads of other ones. Lots of ecology-related things. Uh, obviously, the projects change as mm. science um, moves along. But right now, there's quite a few. You can look for beavers from space. Third. So they have presumably lots of pictures. Okay. And you look for evidence of dams in the landscape, and they mm. use that to kind of quantify how many beavers there are, and uh, you know the the impact on the ecosystem mm. and and stuff like that. Beavers are uh, are they a keystone species? They're very important, right? Because mm. when they dam things, they it's not that they necessarily alter, but the the, the presence of them is very important for sort of. Understanding the ecosystem as a whole. Well, I was more thinking like sort of regulating the ecosystem in some way that I can't remember now. Mm. We need to start watching some more octonauts. Definitely. And up our knowledge of animals. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the kiddo could have told you the answer to that. But yes. They're asleep, so. Um, yeah, so in that case, you're looking for evidence of the animal. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the penguin case, they literally took pictures of like of the landscape from space from satellites, and then you could see how big the penguin swarms are. I don't know what's <laughs> oh God, <laughs> swarms of what's penguins. The flock. I guess uh, they're a bird. Flock. <laughs> I don't know. I also don't know. Colony. Colony. Penguin they're colony. a colony. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> the, the horde, the horde of penguins. <laughs> oh, Deary me. So, yeah, probably in that case you're not counting individual penguins, right? 
Yes. Um, it's not about necessarily exact numbers. It's about how things change with time. So from year to year, yes. you know, and so getting kind of pictures of, of things, getting ideas about. Yeah. We also learned stuff. from a different kids TV program that you can also tell how many penguins are around by how much poo they leave because it changes yes. the colour of the ice from yes. white to brown. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I think that also was... Um, was an important part of your... Yes. Was, so if you want to look at pictures of poo... So the, the penguin watch is still going. Right. Um, they definitely used the poo... OK. Um, to, ...to quantify the health of the penguin colony or swarm on this podcast. <laughs> um, I don't know what the, what the project is currently on, if it's, mm. you know, penguin counting or poo measurements or what i'm not sure but yeah and so ultimately you can get on the paper by doing that when yeah, they well, publish future eventually ones, yeah. yeah future ones i mean presumably presumably they've already published yeah some. yeah because yeah. <laughs> it's not like a new project but then you can put that on your cv like i've um been involved in 17 studies all on different things yeah if if something comes out of the stuff that you have yeah, done. Yeah, okay, so you've got to so, make sure. So you make an account and it you, certain, you know, the images that you've looked at are, like, flagged with your thing so that they can mm. A tribute. be like, you discovered this. We have evidence that you discovered the thing on this image. Right, yeah. So we can put, you can be on the paper. You discovered penguins. Exactly. Um... Yeah, they have, you know, other ones as well that aren't directly space-related but are ecology. Mm. Squirrel mapper, classifying squirrels to measure How do you do that? Selection. I th- didn't... That can't be from space, surely. No, that's not from space. <laughs> okay. That's why I said it's not directly space-related. Okay. okay. But it's it relates to it in that it's a citizen science project on Zooniverse. Okay. And Zooniverse... Are we sponsored by Zooniverse for this episode? (laughs) I wish. It came about from astronomy. Right, yes. So astronomy now lets us map squirrels. And so now, because that was so successful, Mm. because Galaxy Zoo was so successful as a citizen science project and continued for a lot longer than was expected and then expanded into Zooniverse mm. and Zooniverse has you know got has, has done spectacularly well mm-hmm. and has a huge number of projects on it now I remember you know looking years ago and it was it was pretty niche yes you know and now there's a whole range of different things there's like you know um medical science things there's um physical sciences there's astronomy stuff Mm. uh there's biological sciences there's ecology there's climate change related things Mm. um there's history of science you know so like random things like here are some um logs ship logs from like 1400s uh we want to look through because they've written the weather on each day right yeah and we want to track what the weather was like because we know where they were mm. and when they were there and we've got loads of them from loads of different ships and Good. how it's, you know, how different is the weather and, and whatever. So, yeah. like, that's all come about from from a specific citizen science project yeah. doing really well. Um, See, that's interesting because I feel like, you know, we started off saying, oh, intangible societal psychological changes blah, blah 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 and this is very much like it's affecting other things but in a sort of a different methodologies almost that wouldn't necessarily yeah. wouldn't so obviously have come about you know maybe somebody would have come up with an idea to like use citizen science in that way or i guess promote citizen science yeah um because that's this is not the only citizen science um, method but um but yeah 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 and i'm sure they would have in time eventually you know i'm not yeah it's not specifically because of space 
It's just because the thing that came from astronomy, from space, was successful. Yeah, you advances know? the um, method. So, uh, but, yeah, yeah, it was very mm-hmm. interesting. And also it was a huge gamble <laughs> when they started Galaxy Zoo, so it's quite interesting hearing about how that's come along. Yeah. But as well as ecology, there's uh, oceanography. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of sort of... Um, environmental and um sort of um weather related stuff isn't there so um i think in 1960 nasa launches tiros one i've got no idea what that stands for but that's the first um meteorological um satellite it's only up there for a few weeks but you know they get they can do that (laughs) yeah and now there's like more than 150 different sort of weather and climate satellites orbiting at the moment and you get data about you know cloud patterns so you get like those nice images that are like look there's a hurricane heading oh, this yeah. way or whatever um but also you know you can then determine weather patterns and as well as that which i think they originally thought we'll get nice pictures of clouds and then we'll know what's going on people then worked out you can also look at wind speeds and moisture and temperature and other sort of variables which Mm -hmm. then feed into your uh, weather models to then work out what's going on and the same way yeah you can look at um whether it's like the temperature of temperature of oceans or whatever as well as um sort of climate data based on like temperatures of the earth amongst other things emissions you can track like different chemical compositions in the atmosphere right so you can see a lot to do with monitoring climate change and weather patterns as well mm-hmm. yeah but a lot of stuff is just images isn't it which is it's kind of weird it feels sort of almost backwards you know so from like, satellites yeah yeah not that that is the only thing that they do, but it's, it's odd how much stuff we get just from, like, visual. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess we're kind of reliant on it because they're uh, typically, you know, above the earth. <laughs> and anything that you are interested in, be that weather, oceans, animals, are all mm. far, far, far below. Mm. And so it has to be images. Yeah. 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 So you can also, you know, the sort of more depressing side of things is you can watch, watch like sea ice disappear and things more and more each year and that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, you can see it shrinking, um, which is depressing. But it's also useful in that you can quantify it. Mm. Um. I imagine it's not perfect because you're not seeing what's going on underneath the water. Yes. Um, But you can, in some way, quantify Mm. how much it has changed from last year, how much it has changed from the average Mm -hmm. over the past Mm -hmm. five years, whatever. Um, Because you can can measure the area. Yeah. um, Rather than just being like, oh, well, there's less of it. It's not in this bit of the ocean where it normally is. Yes. Um, you yeah. can actually, you know, very much quantify it. And a similar kind of thing, I know I've also seen things before about sort of urbanisation, um, like comparisons of photos of yeah. from satellites um, a couple of decades ago versus now, and you can see how cities have kind of sprawled out and sort of the loss of different um, environments. But also you can kind of, I guess maybe from a, more of a town planning, almost civic planning, you can kind of understand the sort of the pressures of different places. Yeah. From a aerial point of view. I also remember in Google Earth you used to be able to do like have you do you ever look at the sort of you could look at the same satellite image from years and years ago. Right. But there were also some you could look at from like nineteen thirties or something that were like taken yeah, by the, planes. Yeah. And it's just and they kind were of like black and white photos. Yeah, yeah, like sepia, and just kind of. Can you imagine, like, if you the 
the amount of planes you'd have to have in the air if you didn't have satellites to like take all of those images. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just not feasible. Um, yeah. yeah. It's interesting what you say about urbanisation, though. You know, I wonder, could you use it in a predictive way? Because mm. you can look at the environment around the city. Can you then predict where people are likely to build next? Yeah, and know? then you decide, well, we should start building, like, sewage systems or, like, water like delivery systems or something. Is that kind of what you like, were meaning? Yeah, just, like, can it be used in a predictive way if mm. we can see the bigger picture? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. Maybe the answer is no, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. I think also the weird... Um, one that I find weird because having said pictures we get lots of pictures Mm -hmm. it's also you can use it for seismology which as far as I'm concerned is uh, there's somebody in like a dark room and there's like a little (laughs) needle on a bit of paper and it goes backwards and forwards and that's seismology but apparently you could use satellites (laughs) Um, and yeah you can like measure the motion of the earth not Mm -hmm. the planet I guess also the planet, but the ground motion. Yes. And vibrations and that kind of thing. Acoustic signals um, via satellites. Uh, And as well as just sort of measuring an event, you can also then measure large areas over time to sort of predict when there's a high likelihood of something to... something's going to happen. Yeah. Well, if you... If you watch for long enough, you'll see the pattern of, in this area, this particular thing happens before an earthquake. Mm. And so if you've watched long enough, you can then be confident that that is what's going to happen. And if you see that event, or you see those signals, you know that in this particular location, that means that an earthquake is probably going to happen. Yes. Yeah. And it can also, you know... Um, predict earthquakes by looking at changes in the shape of the Earth's surface. So we think of the Earth as being, you know, spherical, Mm -hmm. but it's bumpy, it's not really spherical. Yeah. And so you can see changes in the shape of the surface as pressure builds underneath. Mm. Um, And if you know what you're looking for, (laughs) Mm. then that can tell you that an earthquake is on the way. Or equally... You know, looking at water levels as well, because sometimes the earthquake's going to happen under the sea. And yeah. so yeah. That, that surface maybe can't be seen, but you can see how the water's changed. So, yeah. yeah. And then going back to sort of images again, you can also, when there is like a major disaster, like an earthquake, a lot of the time, sort of typical traditional communications have all collapsed. You know, yeah, um, and then, as well as sort of you know satellite based communication, also you can sort of see images like straight away pretty much um from space that show yes. you kind of what has happened in different areas, so you can know that certain areas have been like completely demolished, yeah, um, and maybe prioritize aid going to that area or like the different types of aid, you know? yeah. And also, you know, if there's, like, a rural community, they might not, um, you might not know that they need aid if it wasn't for the satellites, even if all communications are, you know, up and running. Mm. Um, Because there may be, like, not a big um, settlement, if you know what I mean. Yeah. 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 And you can measure the intensity of the earthquakes as well. Mm. As well as the, um, just like seeing that there is an earthquake, which can obviously help you to predict um, how how strong <laughs> is going to mm. be, what the magnitude is, and therefore you might have an idea of the potential damage it's going to cause to the region before it happens. Mm-hmm. Um, but also there are some sensors apparently that can sense changes in the Earth's gravitational field and its magnetic field as well, and they can be used... How does the Earth's mag- uh, gravitational field change? What does that mean? It's heavier in an area. Is that like... Yeah, if you have more matter there. Right, so that kind of like, if there's sort of more, like... 
the pressure and magma or something. Yeah, so like I was saying about certain bits of it bulging or like changing shape by comparison. And then it's getting ready to... um, What's the word? It's it's changed its, you know, its shape and its mass in a certain Mm. place. Uh, its density potentially. So you kind of work so out how that it changes the or... that changes the gravitational field because we don't actually have a perfectly spherical mm. planet. And it's moving all the time. In fact, mm. I think I saw. I'm sure it was just on Google, so I'm sure everyone could look it up. A picture. It was like a plot. You know, it, it had. It was a picture of the Earth, mm. and it had on it like as contours the earth's gravitational field around the surface Hmm. um and it was quite interesting Hmm. i've already talked about how how much of an issue i have with contours understanding yes so we'll see whether i can make head or tail of that (laughs) yeah yeah i mean similar things are like um unrelated but also related you can also um take pictures uh, for intelligence purposes, <laughs> um, which, depending on, Don't I guess... Don't mind us. <laughs> depending on who you are, uh, I guess, maybe, uh, or who it is that's doing the spying, I guess. Um, yeah, I was going to say, depending on who you are, it's either spying or it's intelligence yeah. purposes. Uh, yeah, you might think that's a good thing or a bad thing, or just a thing, because people are spying on each other all the time anyway. So, um, you know. Um, but... I think the first um, the first spy satellite that we know of is it's part of the Corona project, unfortunately named these days, but um, by the Things American can. yeah uh, the the Americans and they sent satellites up and they took photos of the USSR. They found you know they took nice pictures of Soviet. Um, like missile sites and things, um, but what I find so weird about like this, the juxtaposition of we've gone into space and also early space is kind of janky. Yes, <laughs> um, very. Is that it's not like this? The cool. Oh, we've taken images of everywhere and then we just like beamed it down. They took images on like basically a normal like camera, an old yeah. camera with film and then they'd have to like parachute down the like the little film canisters yeah. and then people would have to go into like a dark room and, <laughs> and develop them and things after they'd found them <laughs> yeah um yeah. And, but yeah that was in like 1960 i think for the first time they used it for the first time successfully anyway but yeah uh but you know today as well as you know we obviously still have states monitoring each other and things but you know, there's also, like, open source data, you know, um, sort of non-state um, intelligence companies that also share things like images that relate to human rights violations as well as, like, um, ecocides. So, like, mm-hmm. you know, people can say there's lots of the Brazilian jungle that's been locked down in this area, so... And that kind of thing, which again links back to sort of the environmental side of things. But I guess kind of uh, as well as sort of providing evidence for um, national security or interests, <laughs> um, they also can provide things for um, sort of evidence for um, crimes as well, which is sort of a slightly odd application of satellites, I guess. Yeah. And then a, a different thing, again, is archaeology, which is super cool. I would love to see them bring in satellite archaeology to Time Team. Yes, definitely. So, as far as I'm aware, most of the time it's related to infrared data or near-infrared. And basically, the if something is not that far below the ground, it sends different heat signatures. Right, yeah. Kind of thing. So, because um, if it's made of something different to the local environment, so like a big lump of stone is going to be different in terms of heat compared to, like, um, some sand. So, in 
the main thing I know of is Egyptian archaeological sites and there's some really cool work that people have done there where they've even been able to map out like entire um, lost Egyptian mm. cities. You know, this is sort of archaeology on a scale which you would never be able to do. Yeah, you can't do it from the ground, especially when you don't even know like, where, the, where, it, where is. it is, how yeah. big it is. You know, you can't... Um, you really are in a better starting place if you have some sort of idea of the big picture before yeah. you start. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that I find particularly crazy about Egyptian archaeology is that you know, there's multiple different sort of sites and environments and things, but a lot of it is the nature of the Nile is that it changes over yeah. time. And because of the importance of the Nile when the Nile moves, the city has to move kind of thing. And yeah. relatively quickly, a place will be abandoned because there's no water kind of thing. So a lot of it is to do with tracking where the Nile was. And then there's a whole lot of argument about whether a city could be somewhere or not because yeah, it's the wrong period of time you, or whatever. You've got the time slightly wrong and the Nile has changed a lot in that time. Or you haven't actually completely accurately um, predicted where the Nile was. Yeah, and sort so. of written records are not necessarily great. They don't leave a GPS-like <laughs> location. They don't use the three words. No, they they don't even use longitude and latitude or anything. It's just like, it's on the Nile. Yeah, it's down, on the Nile, whatever. next just to follow the statue the Nile. of the Sphinx. Just next to one of the statues of like, the guy that's okay. in charge at the moment. Great. Um, <laughs> not that one, or the other 7,000 of them, but one of them. Um, and so, you know, you get, like, Egyptologists that are like, it's definitely here, and there'll be somebody else who says it's in a completely different location, nowhere near that. Um, and then with satellite archaeology, you can sort of look at different areas and be like, I think it's probably here. Um, wow. Which is kind of insane. Um, it's nice, actually. I mean, all of the applications are nice, some nicer than others, but, you know... There's something kind of extra nice about that because it's using technology that we think of as futuristic. Mm. I mean, satellites are pretty normal yeah. to, to us, but, you know, the idea that they're in space and they're part of space technology makes it feel, like, quite futuristic. And, you know, ancient Egypt is ancient history. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nice. It's something kind of just pleasing that they can be brought together, you know, mm -hmm. that that this technology can future. be used for that, as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, also, as well as that, you know, you might think, oh, well, that's great, that's another way of identifying new sites to then, like, loot, um, <laughs> basically. Yeah, well, um, the ethics that come along with these things are for... For other people to yeah. debate when um, the, where that is their expertise. Well, I think now Egypt is particularly tight on um, sort of controlling. Um, yeah, quite sites. rightly so. Yeah. <laughs> I think they might have been burnt in the past a little bit. Mm, but, I wonder um, who by. <laughs> yeah, um, but also another aspect of this is you can also use it to monitor sites that you know of. And you can actually yes. check whether um, you can sort of see if there is like um, any damage for whatever reason. Yeah, any uh, looting that is unknown of, especially when it's like in a remote location. It just takes like some people to go with some shovels and dig up. I imagine there's more <laughs> more to it, like um, yeah. that, but yeah. And I think there's there's been a similar thing for um, a place called. Iram of the Pillars, which is mentioned in the um, in the Quran, which is in Amman, maybe. Again, there's like debate on where it is. Um, right. There's also debate on whether it's even a city. Different people think different things. Whether it's one city or multiple ones. Um, but they found a site in Amman that may be linked 
to this, and it seemed like it was sort of like a a post with like a uh, sort of a water reservoir for people that were involved in like frankincense trading, mm. um, wow. and they were able to identify it from satellite imagery, and then they sent off uh, Ranulph Fines, no less. Uh, to go and um, not to be confused with Rafe Fines, um, <laughs> who, yeah, they didn't send Voldemort um, to go and check it out, and they're like, yeah, that could be a place. Is that what he's most famous for these days? Uh, well, what would you say? I don't know. Grand Budapest Hotel. Oh yeah. Is that, that one? Yeah. Good movie. Yeah. Um, there's also stuff. I'm not sure if this is one's different, but in a similar way to sort of. Um, Vast desert areas that you can't really expect people to search very easily, especially with the sand moving all the time. Um, there's also stuff about um, Mayan and I think also um, Incan settlements or tracks in either sort of a remote Peruvian sort of deserty landscapes or um, rainforests in like Guatemala. I think in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and you can sort of see through the tree canopy. That's and, cool. Yeah, which otherwise you, you wouldn't be able to obviously find. So you can then sort of connect different uh, settlements because you now know where all the different roads are and things. And wow. yeah, it's just a level of information that we didn't have otherwise. So that was quite a long run through of some of the things that satellites have provided us with. Yeah, probably not exhaustive either. <laughs> no, but just some of the things that we think are interesting. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other things that space has done for us. So tune in next week and um, we'll tell you more about some other things that space has done for you. Um, slightly more random but um, equally impressive. Yeah. So that just about wraps things up for this episode. Please, can we encourage you to subscribe to Through the Telescope wherever you find your podcasts, and if you like, you can leave us a nice positive review as well. It really helps the show, and it makes it easier for more people to find us. Feel free to send us any comments, questions, or suggestions of things or people you'd like to hear about or from in future episodes. Or perhaps to put yourself forward to chat about your own astro research or experiences. As always, you can find us on Instagram at Through the Telescope Podcast, or you can find me at astrophysicist underscore rose. You can also find us on Twitter at The Telescope Pod, and you can contact us by email at through the telescope podcast at gmail.com. And with that, we'd like to thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye! Bye.